Welcome back to the Digi Gods Podcast at the uh, very end of September, beginning October, belated this week because uh, poor Mark is still recovering. He, uh, after after a little bit of a relapse after our last show, Mark, uh, we're going to give him some time. So I'm here with Tim. Yay! Tim Cogshell in the house. Becky, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to make any jokes about Mark. I'm not going to say anything because Mark, Mark, get better. Yeah, we yeah. want him to get better. Uh, Mark, has, for those who don't uh, monitor the uh, Facebook page, Mark has viral bronchitis and has had for a number of weeks, and he is still coughing and having a really hard time it's, with it. It's, so. it's one of your better bronchitis. <laughs> you know. it's, it's a mess. If you have to do something with your voice, if you have to talk for extended periods of time, it just makes it really, really difficult. So, um, Plus, Mark, Mark still goes to work. I don't know. What's the difference? There's viral bronchitis? Is there some other kind of bronchitis? Like there's bacterial bronchitis. Okay. There must be. If there's a viral one, or that's the only thing to distinguish them. Either way, I, I was just wondering if there's something like a, like, you know, a Hungarian bronchitis or <laughs> something. I don't know. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll uh, give Mark a little bit of time to uh, pull himself together. But in the meanwhile, um, movie-wise, we are into the fall now. The fall season yeah. is officially upon us, which means we're going to be inundated with screeners and our, our awards voting nightmare pretty soon. Well, to be frank, I got uh, screeners for Miles Ahead. Yeah, I did too. Maggie's Plan and a, you know, the For Your Consideration yeah. type screeners. Yeah. I don't know, two, three weeks ago. I did too. Sony Classics was on top of it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, they might have they they shot that wad too soon. This, thing, this I, is the I, thing. Right that, now, I couldn't find any of those movies. Yeah. Made me. Well, this is the thing that always panics me around this time. Because I would love it if we'd start getting all of our award screeners now. Beginning yeah. of October. First week in October is when we really should start getting them. Because we usually vote around December 10th. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you do that math. Uh, that basically is not quite ten weeks to see what amounts to, even when you whittle it down, you're going to be somewhere between 40 and 60 movies. Yeah. I mean, when we chat in the room, people are arguing about, you know, at least 30 movies that are in the running between all the major awards. And that's once you, you know, you've probably wasted your time on 10 or 12 or or 20 movies that nobody else likes. So... I mean, that's a lot of movies to watch in ten weeks. It really is. It, it is. You know, some Considering we don't usually get them, start getting them until like literally the second week in November, which leaves you not even four weeks to see them. To see the movie. Yeah. Now, some of these movies, of course, uh, we will have seen uh, you know, during the, the year. Of the year, yeah. but uh, but not many. Most of them, you yeah. know, you know, hold their fire. Yeah. Uh, until that period that we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, which means that you know we're we're seeing seeing them for the first so time. So many. Too, you know. Uh, so yeah, you, you're right, uh, and frankly, you know, too many, uh, too many. Period. Today, today was a broadcast film week. Broadcast. Yes. Today's Friday. Uh, 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 the list uh, this week: thirty five films. That's ridiculous. And we didn't talk about all thirty five. And films. I was on last week with Claudia. With some, and we had twenty eight. Twenty eight. So, and this is becoming sort of ordinary now. I can remember when you, sixty movies 60 in two weeks, weeks. In two weeks, when we found when we thought it was outrageous if we had twelve or fifteen yeah. movies. Uh, and, and so now we don't even talk about it as being outrageous anymore because it's just the number of releases. And, and you and I were talking about this the other day, which is this is what is sobering. If you're an aspiring filmmaker, this is what you have to be sobered about because the, one of the things that happens when you do Film Week is that you realize it's not like working for a newspaper and somebody says, oh, I'm assigning you this review this week, okay, and you write it and you're focused on that one film. When you do Film Week, you are made aware of the fact of that there are X number of movies opening on a given week. You look at the totality of it. You have to cover them all. Yeah. And when you do this for a number of years, you realize that even on the off weeks during the year now, we are up to you know, 18 to 22 movies. I mean, it's, you're, you're averaging about 20 movies a week. Commonly. In, in, a, in a city, in a market like Los Angeles or even New York. You're, commonly, you're going to average 20 movies plus every week. That We used to have about 600 releases a year in the United States. There are about 600 releases that are usually Oscar eligible. Yeah. But if you consider that in Los Angeles there are 20 movies a week. Now, 20 times 52. 500 and so that, That's 1,000 movies. 1,000 movies. Yeah. That's over 1,000 movies. There's no way on any given week that more than three or four of those movies actually have a legitimate place in the marketplace. And of those four, you can assume that two are going to be studio movies. So, and, and Making the point, of course, that we're talking about films that are theatrically released yeah. at least some point. Yes. Uh, we're not talking about films that are, uh, you know, the VODs and no. the ones that are no. even this more. this is in a theater. Yeah, these are movies being released in a theater. So, you know, if, you're, if you want to make an independent film that makes a mark, uh, uh, there are about 100 slots a year 
that you could fill. And if you assume that already established independent filmmakers like Jim Jarmusch and, and whoever else, mm. uh, are, that they are going to fill half of those, that's about 50 movies at best, at best, 50 slots in a year that you might have a chance to fill. And there are how many tens of thousands of people looking to fill those? This business is getting insanely competitive. It's yeah, well, yeah, really hard. you know, and it's, it's a very strange thing too because you know, obviously, we're, we're talking about theatrical releases. Yep. There are, in fact, way more screens than there was. Say, say back when you were, um, uh, uh, you know, managing theaters yeah. thirty years ago. Yeah, right. There are way more screens than there were. So then. many more. Multiplexes um, now, multiplexes and all of that things. That didn't even, and then, of course, uh, we we know about all the you know the, the rest, the balance of, of yeah. the ways that movies are distributed now, uh, uh, VOD, and of course Netflix and Amazon, and the and how the perception of all of those things have changed over the decades. It used to be that if a movie didn't get a theatrical release, then it was just a given. Uh, that it was probably uh, either a not a very good movie or uh, or, or a B movie. Not yeah. necessarily now. So today. You know, look at that list of 30, 33 odd uh, movies. You work your way down that list around movie twenty two, twenty five. You're still looking at sort of namey leads. You're still yeah. looking at these sort of namey directors. You know, True. yeah, yeah, maybe former movie stars, but nevertheless, people with names and yeah. and, and and folks making movies. You know, I had a movie today. Chronic was one of them. Tim Roth movie. Michelle Franco. Uh, a director, you know, and this is a Tim Roth movie. I know. Not fifteen people are going to see this movie. Yeah. In a in a theater, uh, uh, you know, this weekend. Well, not Stardom 15. does not mean what it used to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It may not actually exist. Well, let's jump into some new movies this week. Uh, on that nice rosy note about this, uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the the dead end horrible. Well, there are, there, there's a place where all of these movies land. And yeah. They're here in our hands. Right? Yeah. So, uh, Tim, Warcraft. Um, let's talk about Warcraft for a second because uh, I, I do not play this game. Ah, that was not one of the, you know. I have never, I, I, the world of Warcraft, I know nothing about. I have no connection to it whatsoever. Uh, I remember think, having very mixed feelings when this was announced because Duncan Jones was hired to direct this. Yeah. Duncan Jones, otherwise known as Zoe Bowie of birth. Yeah. Uh, David Bowie's son. He made a great movie called Moon. You know that, that was Rockwell that was the years, that yeah. was the start, and then he yeah. did the Jake Gyllenhaal thing after that. And he's uh, you know definitely one of those directors that was on everybody's uh, lit. Not just because you're you're David Bowie's son, but he's legit talented. I mean, he is legit yeah. talented. Yeah. Um, he is a for real filmmaker. He's got a great sense of story, a great sense of style, uh, especially when working with genre. And I thought, okay, Warcraft, fine. I don't need to know anything about it. I guess I'll just give him a shot. You know, I got to be honest. I just don't get it. Um, it's like it's like he what he did in this. Anybody could have done. It's just so much CGI. It's just so much uh, fantasy mayhem and uh, creatures. And I, I just I you know I don't get it. It all takes place in this um, in this world called Azeroth. And it is a completely fictitious uh, fantasy battle of the Lord of the Rings variety. And uh, it doesn't really pave any new ground. It doesn't do anything really that remarkable. I feel like I've seen this at least 20 times in the past decade. And uh, and yet, uh, people who do... L- and this film tanked domestically, by the way. It sure did. Man, did it bomb. Yeah. Uh, but Corey... Our beloved Corey, who does our, our intros. Corey is a big fan of Warcraft, the game, and actually defends the movie. And uh, I, will, I will give him the benefit of the doubt that if you are into the game, this is uh, somehow uh, a thing. In any case, uh, loaded with x-rays on here. Uh, we have, they sent us the Blu-ray, DVD, and Ultraviolet combo set, as well as the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray and uh, Ultraviolet combo set. Um, the... Um, the uh, the difference between them really, I mean, I, 4K makes a big deal of a difference with this movie. I'll be honest. It's the the C, anything with heavy amounts of CGI always really really benefits from the addition of a uh, 4K resolution. Um, there are Blu-ray exclusives on here. Lots of uh, behind the scenes special effects and and how they made it, uh, featurettes and whatnot. Tons and tons of that stuff. Costumes and you know just how it, how it all falls together. Madame Tussauds thing on here as well. Uh, and uh, on the 4K, you obviously just get this unbelievable picture and incredible audio, which really, if you have the right system, it kind of, it, I will say it's almost worth it by itself, just for the reference you know, value of it. But still, I just, 
I'm kind of, I, I kind of miss it. But here's the interesting thing to me that I want to get to. So Legendary, mm. who used to you know do do the uh, co-finance the Batman <laughs> films over at uh, Warner Brothers, they're now with Universal. Yeah. And Legendary is now significantly capitalized by the Chinese. And this movie was released in China and made an ungodly, unholy amount of money. Which answers a whole lot of questions. Which answers a whole lot of questions. So, so Warcraft, which tanked in the U.S., was a phenomenal through-the-roof success in China, which guarantees there will be more. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Which may or may not get theatrical releases yeah. in the United States, but it doesn't cost any more to do yeah. it now because you don't have to make 15,000 prints All true. anymore. And, 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 the, and, of course, the marketing dollars are amateurized over the entire yeah. world yeah. now. Yeah. So you, you know, you're going to make those ads anyway. True. Uh, and uh, so, you know, yeah, it's a, whole, yeah. it's a whole new deal now, man. Yeah, anyway. uh, I got one over here that you gave me. I'm glad you did because I happen to have seen it for the show Hunt for the uh, Wilder People. Uh, a Sam Neill film. Hadn't seen Sam Neill in a while. This was a perfectly charming little movie. I really, really liked it. It's about this little boy, perfectly round little boy. Mm-hmm. It looks like he weighs about 300 pounds, <laughs> but all condensed into, uh, you know, about four foot two. Uh, and uh, you're just a handsome little devil. He's uh, completely out of control. Uh, he's um, uh, a foster child. Yeah. And they eventually send him out to the out to the woods to live with this foster family uh, w- at at which Sam Neill is the father. Uh, and him and Sam Neill just end up on one of those sort of Australian walkabouts, you know. Yeah. Uh, where Sam is teaching him all about, you know, stuff that you do when you're in, on a walkabout in Australia. And you know, and the little boy is teaching Sam how to act like a person. It's a really really funny film. Uh, I cannot pronounce the director's name, but it's Taikaka Watahaki. Can you pronounce it? Taika Watiti. Taika Watiti. I'll tell you why I know that, but carry on. Uh, So uh, one of his, uh, you'll know him from Eagle vs. Shark. Mm -hmm. Uh, You remember that? Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is just very, very sharp. And a couple other movies uh, from from New Zealand, actually, not Australia. So Taika Waititi, uh, who here's why here's why I know uh, about Taika Waititi. Uh, Taika Waititi did a short film, an Oscar-nominated short film, oh, about I'm going to say 12 years ago, uh, which is an amazing uh, short film, all black and white, set in a parking lot. Mm-hmm. It was Oscar-nominated. Uh, it is. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, I'm taking a look myself. It was uh, Two Cars, One Night. That's oh, what it is. Two okay. Cars, One Night. So, uh, Two Cars, One Night. And um, it's basically about a couple of cars in a parking lot, and the adults are inside for whatever reason, and this little boy and this little girl sitting in these adjacent cars and, you know, making faces at each other and becoming friends. And it's just an extraordinary short film. Uh, that was at the AFI Fest when I was on the jury to judge the short films. Mm-hmm. And we gave it our top award. That won our award and went on to get an Oscar nomination. There was also a film there um, about that was sort of a comedic similarity to it, which was two people in bed negotiating with their attorneys over whether or not to have sex, <laughs> which was also very funny. Also made the short list. We didn't give it that one. Uh, that was Jason Reitman who made that one. Uh, so um, that was, it's, it's interesting to see where these directors go. But uh, I remember Taika was there to accept his award. Was very gracious, and I remember, uh, you know, we talked. We're like, "That's this guy is going places," and sure enough, here he, you know, here we are, a few years later, and yeah, you know, several, several, several fairly decent he's, films. He's, in. he's putting it together. That's interesting. You have a guy like Jason Reichman, who's you know, lineage, and, yeah, and, and sort of pedigree right yeah. out of Hollywood, yeah, you know, with a film there at that time in yeah. that competition, and then you got this, you know, a guy from New Zealand, yeah, not exactly the you know the filmmaking capital of the universe, no, nope. nevertheless competing on exactly the same level and yep. exactly and. and one. It was it was it was terrific. It was uh, really terrific. So anyway, I'm a big fan of Taika Waititi. Big fan of his career. Really thrilled. And this film, really, a really smart thing about what they've done with this film and the marketing of it, they did a uh, a little bit on this film, which is a, a kind of a trailer on to be quiet before movies that mm-hmm. they've been running at a lot of theaters around town, mostly over at the Landmark. Mm-hmm. But it's smart. Because every movie has a little thing on being quiet. The kid, you know, looking at the audience and playing to the audience. And then at the end of this little be quiet teaser that makes, that makes everyone laugh, you know, Hunt for the Wilder People. And you're mm. like, oh, that's a movie? I better go see it. That's very... Brilliant I did, marketing. I did not know about... That's a new one. Brilliant marketing. Very, very smart. Uh, a bunch of, bunch of uh, indies that are hitting <clears throat> direct to uh, DVD this week. Some of them had kind of uh, limited... Uh, Limited releases, uh, but they're all worth uh, checking out. 
Some really, really good stuff here. Clifton Collins Jr. is an actor that I really, really like a lot. I don't think he's ever really uh, hit it as big as he should, but he shows up. He works a lot. He, you know, he's a recognizable face, and uh, he is just phenomenal in uh, Transpecos. Transpecos, directed by Greg Quedar. I hope I'm not uh, completely mutilating his name. But uh, this is all about uh, uh, kind of border patrol corruption around, you know, the border and dealing with border patrol agents and uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Bottom line, it's a Western. It really is a Western. It's a modern-day Western, but otherwise, structurally, it's a Western. And uh, it is... It's an incredibly cool film with great acting done in a great remote location with only a few actors, but it, uh, it's solid. Uh, Greg Quedar, who also co-wrote the screenplay with Clint Bentley, does a really good job. No extras to speak of, but it's worth checking out. That's Trans Pecos, just because I love Clifton Collins Jr. I think he's fantastic. <laughs> then we also have uh, Joel, Kin- uh, Joel Kinnaman and Tom Holland in Edge of Winter, talking about things that take place in uh, the middle of uh, interesting inclement locations. And uh, this is about a guy who just wants to, you know, be a better dad. So he um, basically goes, to, you know, takes his his boys out on a on what's going to be like a father and son outing to go uh, hunting, and uh, it turns into uh, the that uh, the, the the basically the uh, the the movie with the with the bear and uh, Liam oh, Neeson. Uh, the, 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 uh, oh, um, um, the edge. The right? edge. The edge. Yeah, was it, the was, edge? It, was, it was. Yeah, it was the bear. It was uh, it was uh, Alec. Baldwin, it's yeah, and uh, and Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, it's it's uh, no 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 that the no that's the wait wait hold you on. mean the gray with the, the gray wolves. thank you that's, that's what Lee it is Neeson with the wolves getting them yeah. mixed up yeah. so there it is it, anyway it becomes one of those kind of movies there's you know this cabin in the middle of nowhere and uh, anyway um, it, it basically becomes that kind of a thing it's uh, it's sort of a little bit of an exaggerated thriller but uh, you know it's it's generally well done and well acted I don't really I'm not that familiar with uh, Joel Kinnaman but does a perfectly decent job so that's uh, Edge of Winter that's worth checking out and then a really unusual combination of uh, executive producers here uh, Terrence Malick Natalie Portman and Chris Eyre now Chris Eyre will people will remember did uh, kind of uh, hit his stride with Smoke Signals which mm. was a big winner at Sundance Native, Native American filmmaker Native maker. American filmmaker Natalie Portman Terrence Malick what brought those three people together is hard to know but uh, the film is from, this is from Film Movement this is The Seventh Fire and a uh, really interesting film that uh, deals with uh, the issue of gangs and gang warfare and gang politics on a Native, Amer- uh, Native American reservation, mm. which is a subject I knew nothing about. I didn't realize they had gangs on the reservation. Yeah. Uh, but they do. Gangs on reserva- It's a problem on the reservations, and uh, it is a really, really troubling it, look it, at it. And, 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 and we're not talking about we're, – we're talking about intra-tribal yeah. Things right. So you, you yeah. think about the reservation, you think about tribes, and yeah. you think, well, isn't that just gangs already? You know, this yeah. tribe versus that tribe. No, this is more complicated than that. And it's a lot more complicated. It's it, you know, d- their drug problems. I mean, we know there are all kinds of social problems in the reservations, but this really, really gets into a you know, it's it's how it's how sort of tribal warfare has mu- mutated into something mm. kind of post-urban. It's really uh, it's a fascinating film. It touches on a very important subject. It is not an easy film to watch. It's pretty pretty grittily done, but. Um, it's worth checking out. Uh, and that is from a director whose name is Jack Pettibone Rico Bono. Mm. Jack Pettibone Rico Bono. Not an easy name to pronounce, but definitely a filmmaker to watch. Mm, interesting. Uh, I got Mike and Dave over here, uh, which is in. It, look, this movie came out. Had to see it. I saw that trailer. I wanted to cry. It's it just, looks you know, so because, dreadful. It, it, because of, because of the, so you know you got these two guys, uh, Zach Afron and mm. Adam Devine, who's in those Pitch Perfect movies that yeah. I absolutely love. And Zach Afron I actually like too. High School uh, Musical movies. He's uh, on a bunch, bunch of that stuff. All grown up now. Uh, and there are these two sort of goofball brothers that nobody wants to invite to weddings because they're goofball brothers, and they go <laughs> to weddings and they make fools of themselves and get drunk and pick up on chicks. Uh, uh, there's going to be a wedding. They, they the only way that they can go to the wedding is if they bring dates. So mm-hmm. they run an ad in like Craigslist or online or whatever they do, you know, yeah. and they get these dates. Anna Anna Kendrick and Aubrey Plaza. I'm so I so adore Aubrey Plaza. She's <laughs> anyway, that's that's just a personal thing. So. These chicks turn out to be bigger sort of a drunken nightmare monsters than uh, the brothers. And, you know, it's, it's all meant to be ironic in this and that. And I suppose that it probably is. Um, look, uh, 
we all had our period uh, where these kind of movies were, I, I remember a Tom Hanks made a movie called Bachelor Party. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's got to be 30, 35. With years Adrian's ago. Med. Adrian's Med. Yeah. With, with, the, with the great hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and just all that kind of, and So it's not like every you know generation doesn't have one or two or three or 15 of these movies. This is one for this millennial generation. I suppose they like this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, how, how, how credulously do I find? Do I sound right now? Anyway, Blu-ray, uh, deleted scenes, extended scenes, alternate story line with a alternate pig sequence. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, you know, <laughs> a gag reel and so on and uh, so forth. And a gallery. Uh, uh, look, whatever. Like I said, let, let the kids have their stupid ass. Movies. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. Mike and Dave need wedding dates. Yeah, well. Good, good for them. Uh, Central Intelligence, Kevin Hart and Dwayne oh. Johnson. Look, this is this is the unrated version of this movie, which I also saw when it was yeah. out in theaters. This is the thing about this movie. This is the uh, this is the Blu-ray. This is the thing about this movie. So, you know, to my mind, anyway, this movie features two black men. Yes. <laughs> It, you, and, which you know, I mean, for years and years and mm-hmm. years, this would have been you know, it would, yeah, Mel Gibson and, Dan, and, and sure. Danny. Sure, yeah. I mean, you 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 name yeah. the matchup. Yeah, but never before. No, has it been uh, two black men playing this kind of these no, kinds of that guys? buddy cop thing? That's you know. a, it is a, it is a and and the the genius of the marketing of this thing, which I, I like. I think the film's fine. fine. I think it's, it's perfectly fine. fine. It's formulaic. It, it, it fits right in the pocket for it this is. kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and, and and Kevin Hart is the guy. Because he does it with Ice Cube, yeah. You know, then in those ride along movies, he is the guy that has that has I don't know created that little spot that allowed yeah. that leverage to happen. He's le- so they, the, the studio system is no longer afraid to catch cast and two the, black men in these kind of roles. And the marketing of Big Johnson and the Little Heart, come Danny, on, what are you do? Danny come DeVito on. and Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> yeah. for God's sake, it's, just, yeah. it's the same damn yeah. thing. You just yeah. do it with the, with, the, with the little funny guy. Yeah, Excellent stuff. Yeah. So I mean, far I, as that is concerned, it's interesting. I am, I am really happy for Kevin Hart. I, I got to be honest. I'm not thrilled with a lot of the films in the parts he's picking. He seems to be doing the same shtick over and over and over and over. Mm. He's not doing what Eddie Murphy did, which is find unusual ways to apply your shtick. Yeah. You know, like Eddie Murphy in 48 Hours. You're like, okay, that's a, this is like a real movie. He's not doing like he's he's finding moments where he's doing ah black Russian, or, 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 he's doing his or, bit, or, or even in the Beverly Hills Cop where, right. where he created the, the Axel Foley became a it became a sort of meme. Yeah, uh, you know, they, we didn't have memes way yeah. back yeah. then, but that's what he would have been. People knew who Axel that's Foley it. was, and they associated him. And with he was him. able to be an action hero and still be a comic. And still, yeah. And yeah. And, and so I mean, I'd like to see Kevin Hart kind of stretch in the same way. It, it might be a youth thing. I mean, Kevin Could Hart be. is good. Is a good solid thirty. Mr. Eddie Murphy, uh, Mr. Church. Yeah. Uh, you know, another shot at a sort yeah. of dramatic turn for yeah. him. But you know, it took him good. Well, I guess I guess uh, Dreamgirls. He, he had a shot at that dramatic role in Dream. He got a, got an Oscar nomination yeah. for that, but you know, it takes a while. Well, I got a little ro- romantic comedy here, uh, starring Alicia Silverstone. Whatever happened to her? And Ryan Quantin. Uh, it's a perfectly serviceable uh, romantic comedy. It's called Who Gets the Dog. Uh, Alicia Silverstone actually is a more interesting actress now than when she was younger. I, it, it, it's amazing. She's almost unrecognizable. You just like, wow, you grew up, and yeah. I kind of like how you grew up. Um, I'd like to see her get a get a second bite at the at the career, you know, mm-hmm. and not in necessarily movies like this. Like, I'd like to see her get some more career it, roles, studio not necessarily roles. even in movies. You know, she's at that spot right now where yeah. I'm, I guarantee you that movie right there is a movie to remind people who Elisa Silverstone is, so that she can get her own Netflix. Series. Yes, there you go. That's what that's for. Well, anyway, it's about a couple. They break up, and the question is, who's going to get uh, custody of the dog? And you know, if you've ever seen a, a Rock Hudson Dorothy, Doris Day movie. You kind of know where this thing's going to go. Uh, the beats are not that hard to figure out. But two charming actors, and uh, I, I'm surprised to say that I actually found Alicia Silverstone. Uh, you I know. was kind of nuts about her for yeah. a long time. She was a lot of fun. Those Clueless movies actually yep. were funny to me. Indeed. And then uh, a, a strange war movie, uh, Beyond Valkyrie, Dawn of the Fourth Reich. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of these straight-to-video war movies that... It just seems like they don't have a lot of money, but they can afford a few Nazi banners from the prop house, mm. and uh, they can afford like uh, you know a couple of a couple of tanks and some of the old armored vehicles that are sitting around in a in a prop house garage somewhere. So they they rent all that stuff, and then they put together the ultimate B level cast of people who used to do movies like this on an A level. Mm. You know, Tom Sizemore, 
uh, Rutger Hauer, uh, Sean Patrick Flannery, who doesn't even look like himself anymore, uh, and Stephen Lang, who shows up in all this stuff. He was yeah. recently in the, uh, the 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 blind guy in yeah, that. Uh, yeah, was don't that? don't breathe. That's, don't that's breathe. Fede Alvarez, yeah. And of course, Avatar. You know, yeah. he, he does all this stuff because he's all grizzled, and, and so you get kind of like a like a bargain basement version of where Eagles Dare. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, if you like those actors, if you don't mind the fact that this is just very clearly. Uh, There's some people who can't get enough World War II. Yeah. Period. Whatever. Whatever. Anyway, all right. Uh, let's do. Uh, let's do a little bit of. Uh, actually, let's do. Let's do classic movies, and then I've got some anime to, to drill through, and then we'll we'll wrap out with some uh, TV. Oh man! Oh man! Oh man! Oh man! Prince. Uh, we lost our. We, 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 Lost our wonderful purple. Uh, king. It's it's yeah. still it still stings, doesn't it? It's, it's just it's it was burn. so unexpected. You know, it's really funny. So this is a this is a trio of, of Prince films. Uh, purple Rain, of course, Under the Cherry Moon, and Graffiti. All Bridge. on Blu-ray. All, All on Blu-ray. Blu-ray. Um, uh, Prince movie collection. Um, look, this is this is this is what this is what I think about this. I know a lot of people poke at Under the Cherry Moon in in particular. Uh, Graffiti Bridge has its detractors, but you know, if, if you if you like a sort of, it's basically a musical anyway, a sort of you know avant-garde musical. Graffiti Bridge, uh, Under the Cherry Moon. I suggest people take a look at that again. Right? Yeah, it's not that it's remotely good, generally speaking, as cinema, uh, but the story behind it, uh, the sort of complications of it, the fact that his girlfriend uh, was supposed to play that uh, uh, Chris Scott Thomas part, you know, but couldn't act, so you know, <laughs> yeah. he fired her. Uh, I think it was either Lisa or Wendy from the Wendy and Lisa uh, situation that he was involved in way back then. Uh, the fact that he decided to direct it himself. It's, it, it, it's been black and white. This is what I will say about that film with Christopher Crazy. It, it was a fabulous album. <laughs> Under the Cherry Moon. That that yeah, film. True. That film. It was a fabulous album, and this movie is actually pretty funny. So this uh, includes special features uh, that take you inside Prince's world and behind the scenes footage on the music videos uh, that pop up in, in all three of these movies, or, or two of these movies anyway. Purple Rain. I don't think we need to say anything about Purple Rain. Yeah, I. You know, I worked. I, I think I've seen Purple Rain probably 180 times, maybe more, because I. I was. That's when I was an assistant manager at the theater that uh, had the exclusive on it in Los Angeles. About and 1983, 82, yeah, 83, 83. I think 83. 83. Uh, no, uh, hold on, hold on. Was, 83, was, 84, was 84, 84, 84, 84. 84. Okay. 84. Anyway, uh, man, that I just that was that in the Killing Fields. I saw those two films like so many times. I, I just can't. I. I don't even know. Anyway. Yep, every day, this movie, man, that's really unfortunate. But this is nice, Purple Rain Under the Cherry Moon, Graffiti Bridge, good, good going on you. Yeah, yeah, can't, can't, can't be too upset about that. Um, you know, we've got uh, a couple of interesting ones from Criterion, uh, which I never would have imagined in a million years would wind up on Criterion. Uh, at least one of them. Valley of the Dolls by the great Mark Robson, which is a, a big deal. I mean, Valley of the Dolls is a really, really terrific movie from 1967, uh, Mark Robson, one of the great big directors of the day, uh, you know, I, I, really a really a, a fascinating film, um, all about the you know the narcissism of the era. I mean, Jacqueline Suzanne's novel was like a it was a popular sensation, and the you know Patty Duke and Sharon Tate and so many you know great actresses showed up in this thing, and it just kind of defined a certain mentality of the era, and. I'm not. I'm not surprised to see that on a Criterion Blu-ray. That's a that's a serious deal, and a lot of great extras on here, uh, including a 2009 uh, gala tribute to uh, Patty Duke that they had in uh, San Francisco at the Castro Theater. Um, featurettes, documentaries, promotional films from 1967, even a, a television episode uh, from Hollywood Backstories 2001. I mean, screen tests. It's just it immerses you in the greatness of this film. It is a fascinating snapshot of a zeitgeist. That is Valley of the Dolls. And then somebody at Criterion clearly said, hey, here's an idea. Why don't we release it on the same day <laughs> on Blu-ray with Russ Myers' Beyond the Valley of the Dolls? Roger, Roger Ebert wrote that, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's a weird twofer to get on a one week because the, the movies are nothing alike. Three years later... Beyond the Valley of the Dolls uh, was released as a Russ Meyer movie, which is... Uh, it's got really got nothing to do with Jacqueline Suzanne or the yeah. original movie. It just riffs on it, basically. Uh, it and is, that's it's so mod. And, and, it's, and it, it takes the... It, it, it taps into the other zeitgeist of the day, right? You know, whereas Valley of the Dolls is all about a certain kind of 
um, bourgeois middle American Americana beyond the Valley of the Dolls gets into that whole kind of quasi hippie kitsch, yeah, uh, and that's just below the surface, which is the world that Russ Meyer, you know, inhabited. It's it's not quite porn, yeah, but it's it's it, porny. It's in the it's all it's set porny. In the, it's all the set in the music industry yeah. with 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 uh, people who sort of on the fringes of society. It's all very yeah. sort of you know three three you know three female three women who are all rockers and they're you know they're they're their whole weird sixties uh, Hollywood scene. And uh, you know, I mean, it's it's sexy and it's weird and funky, and uh, it's got an audio commentary from 2003 that Roger Ebert recorded for the previous release of this. It's got an audio commentary from 2006, featuring uh, some of the cast and uh, lots of really, really amazing, cool extras on it. Um, I, I I just find it fascinating that these two films are out on the same day, both from Criterion. I, somebody there at Criterion had a brainstorm. I think it's kind of genius, even though it just feels weird. But this is kind of an amazing two for this week. It really is it, it, kind you, of you, amazing. What, what, what's interesting is how those films have changed positions in the context of the culture. Yeah, totally. Over the course of fifty True. or more or, or more years, such yep. that they are in fact Criterion releases now. Yeah. When in fact, I mean that the very novel, the Jacqueline Suzanne novel. Yeah. That was that was a kitschy novel. It was pulp. Yep. It, it was, it, you know, I mean, I'm old enough to have read that novel many, many years ago. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's, it's a bad thing. But there it is with the quaaludes and the Valium and <laughs> it's just, you know, all that stuff behind it and the sex uh, and, 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 or, or allusions to sex. Yeah. Anyway, we think about that in terms of Fifty Shades of Grey today. Yeah. Now, imagine 60 years from now, the Criterion release or whatever of Fifty Shades of Grey. I just can't see it happening except that it did <laughs> because, you yeah. know, there they are on Criterion. So here's here's one from the uh, from Warner Archives, which is really uh, such an amazing rediscovery. I, I got to be honest, this is a Blu-ray. Warner Archives is, is releasing about a Blu-ray a week now. It used to be that we were getting about a Blu-ray a quarter. Now we're getting a Blu-ray a, almost one a week. There are a few weeks that go by that there aren't, but generally, you're getting at least two, maybe three Blu-rays a month out of the Warner Archive collection, which is fantastic because they do such a great job uh, curating their releases. Um, you know, of all the MOD divisions at the studios that have them, Warner Archive really do, they do an amazing job. They just really, they pay attention. They're not just blowing stuff out. They're picking and they're, you know, they're combining things and creating themes and finding, you know, commonality between them and, and really giving it historical relevance. This is a movie I had completely forgotten even existed. This is Man in the Wilderness, uh, starring Richard Harris. Now... At first glance, you think, oh, it's Richard Harris doing A Man Called Horse again. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's the English guy who's all grizzled, and it's a Western thing, and, you know, survival, and yada, yada. You think it's a, think it's a man called, a revisited Man Called Horse. Yeah. It's not. It's the same story as The Revenant. Oh. He is basically playing that the, guy. the DiCaprio character from yeah. The Revenant. Mm-hmm. This is a better movie. Yeah, that's Partly because there's no CGI bear. <laughs> there's no opportunity to say, D- did the bear rape him? That stupid <laughs> thing that people came up with is ridiculous. Uh, no, it, this is all done, you know, in that, in that late 60s, early 70s style that gave us not only A Man Called Horace, but things like all the Clint Eastwood movies of that era, oh, yeah. Josie Wales, yeah. right, all that stuff. You know, it has that, it has that feel to it. Uh, Altman uh, and all that. All that, yeah, the yeah. Altman things, yeah. It, it's, it's got that, that late Western era thing, and it really suits this story. Uh, the, you know, it, it, I think it's also more faithful to the story uh, than The Revenant. The Revenant, you know, takes some tremendous liberties just to kind of give it a dramatic structure. But Richard Harris, you know, as that, uh, as that character, uh, Zachary Bass, does a great job. And you also get John Huston, who is a real baddie in this thing. The only thing that's better than John Huston as a director is John Huston as an actor. He is fantastic. So that is a beautiful, unexpected Blu-ray from the Warner Archive collection. Really, really nice that, uh, that they came out with that. And by the way, here's what I really love about this. They did not re-rate it. They went with the original rating. This is the early, you know, early 70s rating system. GP. When, GP, general public. Interesting. Before there was parental yeah. guidance, yeah. there was general public. Interesting. GP. Interesting. I had forgotten about that completely. They left the original rating on the box. I think it's great. Feel, just the feel of the era is fantastic. I had forgotten about that completely. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple over here. So, uh, The Shape, H.G. Wells, The Shape of Things to Come. So, uh, the the film that's coming to everybody's mind right now, 1936 film. 
the, the original uh, things to come. Things to come. And this is the, uh, the, this the, is like the, 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 the shape of things to come. So it's the same thing, and that's right, uh, yeah. that's right. They, they, but they, again, they, yeah. they just made it again. So this is a 1956 uh, film. Uh, I'm sorry, 1979 film. I should remember that. It's 1979, so you yeah. graduated from high school. Jack Palance. Uh, and all that. This is uh, this is on Blue Blu-ray. I don't know these movies that came out back then, um, that lived in that world of Battlestar Galactica and Logan's Run, and you yeah. know, even if even when they were adaptations adaptations of things, they had a certain sort of kitschy look to them that I still love. You know, everyone seemed to be able to wear a jumpsuit. Uh, a sort of one piece jumpsuit that zipped or buttoned up the middle, mostly yeah. zipped up the middle, and everybody looked great. Star Star Crash is one that comes to mind. All the post, oh, the, yeah. the post Star Wars thing. Everybody wanted to do a Star Wars ish thing, but they weren't Star Wars. They yeah. sort of owed more to Barbarella than they did to Star Wars, right? They're very mod. Always yeah. very, very yeah. mod. Like, like Galaxina was another one. Uh, so, you know, all that. anyway, this is, uh, this is, this is uh, an adaptation of the H.G. Wells, yeah. but in that sort of late, late 70s yeah. sort of mode. Um, uh, Jason's Journey, an interview with Nicholas Campbell. Uh, Symphonies in Space, an interview with the composer of the film, the, the, actually, which is very interesting. Uh, and, and, and a few other things. Rated PG, not GP. So by 1979, <laughs> they had switched that over uh, to GP. Um, and that's on Blu-ray. Blu-ray. Uh, Rod Serling's Patterns. I, I wasn't familiar with this. from 1956, right? Yeah. Um, so um, a Fielder Cook. Uh, you know, did this movie? Um, Van Heflin, uh, Everett Sloan, Ed Begley. You know, yeah. old old Ed Begley in this movie. So this is a tell about uh, uh, you know, ruthless men and women of an, and women of ambition uh, uh, trying to get control of a million dollar television industry. Uh, the craft television, sure, that which, which was a real thing. People, yeah. pe- people, people. We always talk about the three networks: ABC, CBS, and NBC. Yeah, which were the networks that you and I grew up with. There were networks that preceded that. There was the DuPont Network, the Kraft Television Network. There were lots of sure. television networks all yeah. around the country. So, uh, like, then they, they sort of faded away. This is about one of them and what happened uh, to make this particular network go away. Interesting black and white film, 1956. Uh, Blu-ray on Blu-ray. I wonder I, I, what about what about putting on this this one Blu-ray from 1956 might enhance it a bit, right? Well, this, uh, and this uh, and this uh, yeah, and this is from the film detective. Who a lot of our uh, listeners, you know, we interviewed the the guys from the film detective uh, previously, and they they just keep doing really really good work and picking great films. So Rod Serling's Patterns, film detective, well done. So uh, I've got an, I've got something here which is a massive conflict of interest, and I don't care. I'm going to go ahead and review it anyway. Uh, from the Cohen Film Collection, two films from Douglas Sirk. Two films from Douglas Sirk. The films are Lured, which uh, is a lovely film that also has uh, Lucille Ball in it, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, but I really want to focus on A Scandal in Paris. And here's how I want to focus on A Scandal in Paris, because A Scandal in Paris has an amazing feature audio commentary. It may be the single greatest audio commentary in fact I'm not even going to say that it's not only the greatest audio commentary in history it is the greatest combination of English words <laughs> it, it, I'm going to go a step over the, it's the greatest thing ever in the universe it's the greatest thing ever this commentary best thing ever in the universe uh, the reason is because I did it the, uh, so this is uh, my first ever solo commentary alone I've always done commentaries in the past with people that's the you, one that you did re- 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 recently, recently right? Yeah. I remember we talked about that yeah. yeah. so I mean I've done commentaries with you I've done them with Mark Andy, I've done them with Andy, done with Andy. Andy. Yeah. yeah we've all you know we've all done so it, it's one thing you can corroborate this it's a great thing when you do a commentary with a partner because yeah. you sit there and you lose your space and you miss something and you just and somebody your they, turn. They just take they it just, over. They just fill in. Run Everybody's prepared. And then you find your spot again, and then you can. And, and it's a very nice flow. It, doing it alone, you sit there with all your notes and all your time code notes, and you look at that screen, and your stomach drops into your toes, and it, it takes twice as long mm. because you'll you'll start running out of time. You'll go, oh, God, can we back it up? And so I can. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I'm showing. I know I'm showing how the sausage is made here, but, but there you go. But that's what it is. Oh, and you back it up, and then you you got to redo it. It just took forever. But when you do but, it with two people, you can just about do it in the real time of watching can. the film with you one of, you know, with, with a, a stop or two. So anyway, this was uh, this was really really. Uh, both of these films have been out before on DVD, but never like this. They they are absolutely gorgeous. What Cohen has done is just spectacular and beautiful. Um, the, the scandal in Paris is an interesting story. It's the 
It is, it is based in fact, very, based very loosely in fact, it is with uh, George Sanders as, an out, as a, a roguish outlaw who, uh, during the Napoleonic era, who, you know, takes a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a bit of a scandal, scandalous, um, oh God, I don't want to give anything away. He, he, um, he assumes a certain status in society in order to execute a certain con. It's sort of a, you know, a bit of a scam, a bit of a con that he, he's going for. But what's so great about this, even though it plays very loosely with historical fact and, and the real character, and he does play a real character, but it's, you know, uh, really takes great liberties. But still, it's George Sanders doing what people love in George Sanders, which is he's just being, uh, you know, he's just being that, that debonair, very droll guy. And he was so good at it at the time. And um, the thing that I find most interesting about this film, too, which if you listen to my commentary, the backstory on a lot of the characters, the, the other supporting performers, one of his supporting actresses, incredibly tragic story and there's another supporting actress who's a young girl and there's also a very very tragic story mm. I will not get into it but it's worth listening to it, 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 I'm not to con- continue to sort of stroke myself on the commentary but it's worth listening to the commentary because I will tell you those stories and it makes the film richer as a result so two films by Douglas Sirk from the Cohen Film Collection Scandal in Paris and Lourdes extraordinary stuff uh, I have Labyrinth over here I, did, I had dude 30 I know 30th Year anniversary. I know. David Bowie, Jim Henson. I'm going to go drown myself Labyrinth. in your not sink. To, not to mention Jennifer Connelly. I know. That means that Jennifer Connelly is more than 30 years old. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's impossible I know, that's a right problem. There. Yeah, that's so a problem. What, <clears throat> this is complicated. We have two uh, DVDs here. DVD, uh, digital HD with ultraviolet in my right hand. That's uh, if the, the, uh, well, one, the, the 4K. One's the, Blu- one's the Blu-ray, one's the 4K. And then yeah. the 4K in my left hand. And, but as I look at the back of these and I look at the special features, I mean, people will remember the film. Jen, Jim Henson, uh, 16-year-old girl, Jennifer yeah, yeah, Conley, her, right. brother, her brother is kidnapped. The Goblin King, played yeah, by David, David Bowie, Bowie. Yeah. Uh, gives her X number of hours to go and solve yeah, the yeah, lab yeah. and get her brother back. Um, which is a really fantastic movie, by the way. Yeah. I, I put it right up there with Ridley Scott's Legend. It, 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 I do, right, too. Right and, in the same world. And, and there's a lot of, I mean, pre-CGI era, a lot of the special effect work in this, all that kind of upside-down, right-side-up stuff that's going There's some really cool stuff in this movie from yeah. an effect standpoint Re- that today we take for granted. Not to some, mention all of the C- not CGI, yeah. but built practical effect that's goblins it. and huge creatures that are there yeah. in the room that these actors are acting Because today, some kid on a, you know, with a... With the laptop could throw this kind of these kinds of effects together just with some of the the, the software we have today. But then, it was a real big deal. Yeah. It's very impressive. Yeah, you're not just wrapping creatures and yeah. but anyway, as I mentioned all of that because a good many of the special features on these, which I think is what what really is is interesting about this as well as the movie. But as I look at these two, the 4K and the in the DVD uh, HD, the features are not all the, exactly the same. No. So, 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 you know, I don't know. That always confuses me a little bit, particularly yeah. since, given that they are actually literally coming out at exactly the same moment right now. The features wouldn't, be, wouldn't all be the same. Um, so over here, uh, um, a couple of things that are the same. The reordering of time, a look back at Labyrinth, that's on both. The Henson legacy, that's on both. Remembering the Goblin King, that's on both. Then we have... Um, uh, the story, t- the, the, the storyteller is a picture-in-picture track with a commentary track by the conceptual designer that's over here on the DVD. Yeah, uh, that does not seem to be over here on the 4D. On the 4K. On the 4K. Yeah. Uh, and and two or three other things, uh, journey through the labyrinth with the with the characters, the quest for the god, all, all this kind of stuff. So I don't know. That's, that's always a little interesting. What's what's the story behind that? Why wouldn't these be exactly the same? I have the slightest idea. That's an issue that uh, Sony will have to uh, contend with, and they'll have to explain that to us. Yeah. I don't know. Don't get it. Don't get it. Uh, we got some more from Warner Archive. Uh, the Doris Day James Cagney film, Love Me or Leave Me. This is also on Blu-ray. Also beautifully, beautifully, beautifully done. This is a uh, beautiful Technicolor Cinemascope widescreen uh, classic. And uh, it all it's basically the story of uh, Ruth Edding, who was a singer in the 1920s. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's one of those, you know... Um, Oh, how would I put it? One of those uh, gun mall mobster stories done in the Hollywood style. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. James Cagney is great. Doris Day is great. I mean, two great stars. Uh, really a, just a beautifully made film. Not real gritty uh, 
in any way, but this thing won a, it got a bundle of Oscar nominations very deservedly. It's beautifully put together. And uh, maybe the, you know, one of the better films directed by Charles Vidor, who, you know, was a good workman-like studio director, but rarely sort of identifiable in his style. Anyway, really fantastic Blu-ray, well chosen. And then a, a couple of other Warner Archive titles on DVD, the uh, DVD-R uh, that is, that they, the, you know, DVD-Rs are burned for the MOD line. Uh, this is volume nine of the Monogram Cowboy Collection. Nine more movies on three discs with Johnny Mac Brown. They made tons of these things back then. They cranked them out in no time at all, which is uh, really what's most impressive. Uh, otherwise, no reason to get into any of these in particular, but they, you know, they, they, this is volume nine already. I mean, the, the Monogram Cowboy things were just relentless. So if you got the other eight, you're going to want to pick up number nine. Got to be a completist. And then the wonderful Jackie Cooper. When a feller needs a friend... Oh, now, it, it, with a title like that, it could only be in the 1930s and 40s. They just didn't use titles like that at any other time. Jackie Cooper was a tremendous child star and uh, grew up to be kind of a fat, flabby old adult actor, uh, but a good actor his whole life. In any case, uh, he's in this along with Charles Sheik Sale. Uh, might be pronounced Sale, an actor I am not that familiar with, but this is uh, based on a book called Lumpy that I guess was a big deal at the time by William Johnston. And uh, effectively, this is, a, uh, this is one of those things that Jackie Cooper was doing quite a bit of at the time, which is you know, uh, just being a cute kid in a movie that appealed to primarily to people from the, uh, who were kind of a, of the Depression generation. And <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's of interest primarily to people who are Jackie Cooper fans. Otherwise, uh, you know, you'll probably want to take a pass on it. It's not going to – if you don't love Jackie Cooper, you're not going to love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you gave me this one, and I'm glad you did. 1995 is the year, right? 1995, yep. uh, you know, I'm writing for uh, the Entertainment Today. I yeah, a sure. We wrote one. Sure. I had to write a review of this movie called Phoebe. Xenophobic experiments, oh right? Oh my god! Now this was the whole thing that was going on. I remember, I remember this very specifically because this yeah. was this um, a, a little, a, a, a very, very young woman at the time named Erica Bendicki. That was her name, oh right? My I actually interviewed her for yeah. the for the newspaper, right? In town, <laughs> right? Met her at her publicist's office and everything. So the whole deal here was this young woman uh, who had been working for a cable television, like uh, you know, one of those. Uh, Public television, public access television yeah. stations in Canada. Yeah, uh, she and some friends uh, pieced together everything that they needed to make a sci-fi uh, epic adventure movie. This movie, uh, Phoebe, a z- a xenophobic experiments. Right? They did this for two hundred and fifty dollars. No kidding. They made this whole movie uh, complete with special effects and pyrotechnics and aliens from outer space. And no s- kidding. And space scenes and all that kind of stuff. It's all, relatively speaking, terrible, but no more terrible, no more terrible than films made by, you know, quasi size, pretty good size studios in yeah. 1995, spending a lot of money, ice pirates and crap like that. That's bonkers. What, what were we just talking about? Yeah. 250 I remember interviewing her, I remember reviewing this film. I remember it being all kind of intriguing at the time. Uh, and now it's out on, uh, it's out on DVD. Anyway, um, if you want to see what you can do with perseverance and a little mm-hmm. hard work, you can actually make a movie. It was a hit, this movie. This movie became a local sensation, and then it got it got picked up by the whole film festival Crazy. scene. It did the whole film festival circuit. Got a release, an actual theatrical release, in the United States of America, which is why I reviewed it and why I interviewed her back in 1995. That is amazing. Phoebe, All right. xenophobic experience. Yeah. And then the last one of our classic movies, and then we're gonna, uh, I'm going to do a, a plow through a bunch of anime, because there's a lot of anime out there, and uh, I've got it all kind of separated into interesting little, uh, little segments. So um, we'll do that in just a moment. But lastly here is uh, Beauty and the Beast, the original animated classic, the only animated film to date to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar, and that may be forever the only one, because they now have their, separate, their own separate category. But uh, this, it, this has been out on Blu-ray before. This is the 25th anniversary edition. This exists for only two reasons. One, to put all three versions of the film on a single Blu-ray. Now, these aren't substantially different. There's the original theatrical version. There's the one that got all kind of digitally cleaned up, which is the, the, uh, the special edition, which is fine. Um, the special edition I like because it has a better audio mix that was done specifically for the home environment. So there's that. And then there's the sing-along version, which is great for 
you know, my daughter who just loves to who loves this movie and just everything Disney these days. Uh, so um, lots of great extras on here as well. This, of course, comes with the uh, Disney movies, the Disney Anywhere, Disney Movies Anywhere thing, which is their version of Ultraviolet, which is fantastic. And uh, a lot of great bonus extras, uh, the, uh, you know, featurette stuff, Mencken and Friends, 25 years of musical inspiration, sitting down with Alan Mencken and all of his collaborators, and uh, except, obviously, for Howard Ashman, who is no longer with us. Mm. And, uh, you know, they have stuff on the recording sessions and... Uh, you know, all this just great stuff that kids and adults will both equally enjoy. But you know what? Ultimately, it's all about the movie. The other reason that this is important is it has an exclusive sneak preview of the new live-action version, which I hate to admit I'm really looking forward to. Mm. As cynical as I usually am about doing these, these live-action adaptations of animated films, which Disney is doubt, do, apparently going to do with every single animated film they've ever released... Um, this looks good. It, Bill, look, Bill it, 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 it depends on how they decide to do it. I, I, I would love to see it if it's a live action version. And of course, there's you know live action version of television, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, uh, and uh, and uh, and they don't wrap it in CGI. What is the point of doing a live action version if you're going to wrap almost everything that's sort of mystical True. or magical in CGI? Then well, we might as well just watch. watch uh, uh, well, for starters, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you and uh, McGregor as Lumiere. Mm-hmm. I just think that's unless or Cogsworth. No, he's he's Lumiere, and I think Ian McKellen is Cogsworth. Mm-hmm. I think that's how they're doing it. Uh, well, anyway, David Ogden Styers in the movie Did the, in, was the original in, 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 Cogsworth, in, 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 in the late Jerry Orbach was oh, Lumiere. So good, yeah. Yeah, Rob, that voice of Robbie Benson that's, oh. that was, made the whole damn movie. Yeah, it did. It sure did. You know. Good old Robbie Back Benson. then, you didn't necessarily have to have a movie star to... I mean, these, these people were all noted actors. But, true. But they Very weren't true. movie stars. Nowadays, yep. to, to do that, you got to have movie stars. All right, here we go. Going to burn through the anime. You ready for this? Here we go. All mm. right, Tim, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burn through some anime. Mark usually takes a nap when I, when I do this, so here we go. Uh, and, and if we have any anime fans... Please, by all means, correct us on our, well, correct me, on my pronunciation or my complete mutilation of things because, you know, I, I uh, am not a native Japanese speaker, so I'm going to destroy some of these names, I'm sure. Uh, uh, Domagar D is, uh, is okay. Uh, Domagar D is a, uh, is a giant robot thing. It's perfectly fine. I didn't watch an awful lot of it. It just kind of feels like it fits right in there with all this kind of pre-Transformers uh, sort of uh, uh, get to robo stuff. It's kind of in that same vein. I, I understand it has a certain following, a certain unique following. So Domagar, go for it. I, not, not necessarily my thing. Uh, on the fantasy end of things, we've got some uh, Blu-ray DVD combo packs here from Funimation. Uh, Arslan, the heroic legend of Arslan. This is season one, part one. Um, something I was not particularly fam- uh, familiar with. Beautiful animation. Uh, it is a you know it is it's a fantasy soap opera, um, essentially in a kind of its own world. Uh, it, I don't want to say it's Lord of the Rings ish because that's always the the default go to to explain something that takes place in its own world. But it's a wonderful fantasy world. It uh, has its own rules and uh, all kinds of interesting quests, and it gets a little bit violent at a certain point, as you might hope it does. But uh, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice Japanese take on a medieval concept, and uh, I found it really quite charming. Uh, laughing Under the Clouds, a little bit more impenetrable. Uh, but uh, this is uh, this is kind of turn of the century Japan, also sort of a but this is a more grounded fantasy environment. Um, very very well done. But most important are the, uh, the 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 artwork here. The animation is just superb. Really really beautiful artwork. Incredibly well drawn. Meticulously well drawn. Beautifully beautifully colored. Um, maybe the most interesting film of all the animated films this week is. Uh, this incredible movie that I've never heard of before called Barakamon. Uh, I'm going to say that again, Barakamon, B-A-R-A-K-A-M-O-N. This is a Blu-ray DVD combo set from uh, Funimation as well. And uh, the whole thing looks, it looks like it's done in charcoal and watercolor. It's just really, really amazing. Um, the story is, is somewhat parochial. Uh, it's uh, it's it's very it's you know almost better like live action, frankly, to tell a story like this. But in this case, it takes on this very poetic veneer. Uh, it's about a young uh, calligrapher whose parents send him to. He's kind of a troubled kid, so um, he his parents send him to a 
to a certain island location. I don't want to, you know, get too far into it uh, as a way of sort of getting him to find himself in a way. And uh, what happens there is, of course, one of these wonderful small village transformational friendship odysseys coming of age. Um, it's it's really uh, it's really uh, quite gentle and quite sweet. But again, it's the it's the artwork that is just so dazzling. It's so beautiful to look at, and uh, Funimation definitely understood that they had something uh, special on their hands. They did a very different kind of a slip cover for this, so the packaging is very much uh, keeping it, paying attention to the fact that it's you know it's it's this matte artwork, and it's very nice, really really nice job. Um, we also have another Roizen Maiden complete collection. Uh, this is a this is specifically. Roy, or Ro, I guess Rosen is how you're supposed to pronounce it. Uh, I've heard it both ways, but uh, Rosen or Roizen Maiden, Rosen Maiden, uh, Zurichspulen, <laughs> which is a German word. That's very German. It's very German. This is uh, you know this is a this is a world that this is one of those worlds that I I just can't really catch up with because it it exists in so many different tentacles and. I can't really keep up with it. You have to do just way too much research to, to really get into it. But uh, great following, and uh, this has 13 episodes on two discs. Um, some interesting features on here, which include the uh, cl- closing animation and the opening animation without any uh, titles or anything like that. So that's always interesting for animation buffs. Um, on the lower end of things, we've got uh, Pokemon the Movie. Hoopa and the Clash of Ages. The uh, this is so it you know it's better than old Pokemon. It this is like new Pokemon, so they've obviously improved their animation techniques and it's a little more sophisticated. Um, but all the monsters, all I could think of, I seriously, I put this in and I started watching it, and the only thing I could think of is if anybody bumps into me on the street looking for <laughs> Pokemon, I'm going to punch them. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I could think of. Every time I see a monster in this thing, I'm like, oh, I bet I'm going to bump into somebody looking for that thing. That's over already, right? I bet, that, that, I bet that, somebody's going to like knock on my door one day and say, is there a Pokemon in here? And I just... Is that over, or are people I still doing that, that? I think it's over. I think it's already over, which is fascinating that oh. something can come, overwhelm, and go that quickly. That's just that, that's fascinating to me. That's, it, is, it is to me, too. It's why I, they shouldn't have made that Angry Birds movie. <laughs> true. If they had no, you know, if, if, you know what? This is going to be done before yeah. this movie comes out. Very true. Very, very true. Uh, Magical Shopping Arcade, Abenoshi. This skews pretty young. This is the uh, complete collection on 13 episodes. Um, you know, when you have a title like Magical Shopping Arcade, I think you figure you know what you're in for. Um, let's put it this way. All I'm going to tell you is, this is all I'm going to tell you about this. When you flip this thing over, first of all, you see a bunch of kids playing and a bunch of weird little creatures on the, on the front. And then you see some girl. Lying, look, look at the artwork, Tim. And then there's a girl oh, on the bottom oh. who's, barely wearing, yeah, who's yeah. barely wearing anything. That's got to be a problem for, one, for either yeah. the top or the bottom. Yeah. One of those is appropriate and the other one's yeah. not. So you think, oh, okay. Well, and then you, when you flip it over, and uh, this is what they let you know on the back. Mysterious giant breasted beauty revealed in her entirety. <laughs> they want to make sure you know which one of those. <laughs> okay. So uh, this skews, I, I want to say this skews young, but it doesn't skew that young. It's a little mischievous. It's not dirty, but it's kind of Benny Hillish. And uh, it involves space pirates with big breasts and a lot of kung fu and magic. And it is completely bonkers and off the wall. And the animation is uh, really uneven. It's kind of funny. I suspect if you're Japanese, you'll really find it hilarious because I'm sure there are references there that I'm never going to get. Really quickly from the Made in Japan line is uh, Den no Coil Collection 2, which uh, which also has kind of that, uh, that very, very cartoonish big face, big headed, exaggerated uh, kind of animation. Uh, this is, you know, not a not a line that I'm terribly fan, fond of, but it's a, uh, you know, it has its it has its following. Uh, in a similar vein is a Punchline, the complete collection. That's on DVD only. This is from Sente. This is not on Blu-ray. Uh, Twelve episodes on two discs. Uh, that also gets a little bit naughty, uh, a little bit uh, mischievous, a little Benny Hillish. Uh, again, not you know, not not really my not my cup of tea. Um, 
here is uh, here are the four this week that are really really amazing. Um, the Omega edition of Death Note from Shonen Jump, which is a phenomenal box set. Uh, just this is this is some of the best anime that's going on right now. It's really really amazing. Uh, you know, it's essentially a, 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 a high school student who enters this, uh, you know, through through this enters this kind of mysterious calling, right? You know, it's it's one of those favorite memes is that a high yeah. school student finds out he's some kind of messianic figure, Not even. right? Has to go to kind of do a some kind of do m- a mythical journey. Anyway, Death Note is great. It's uh, it's really terrific. The animation is phenomenal. The work on this is just magnificent. This is the Omega edition that is worth checking out. Uh, Sailor Moon Crystal. Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon Crystal. Uh, Crystal. This is a Blu-ray DVD combo pack, beautifully put together. It's the set one Dark Kingdom arc. Uh, if you aren't keeping up with the Sailor Moon world, there's you're never going to catch up. Uh, this thing is very elaborate. It includes an 88-page booklet and a bunch of art cards, and it is it is really well animated. It is an incredibly well written line um, of stories, but it just it, it it's sort of it's so elaborate and so all encompassing. It's kind of like Robotech. It's just got if you're not up to speed, it's going to take forever. So uh, anyway, you know, she's got long blonde hair, and she's heroic, and she's cute and lethal, and she is what she is. Uh, Blood Blockade Battlefront, the complete series, episodes 1 through 12. This is from Funimation. Um, pretty cool animation. Uh, it, also a little bit uneven, but when it's on, it's really, really on. And uh, this is from the Studio Bones people who do Full Metal Alchemist and Space Dandy Soul Leader and... Uh, it's a. Uh, this is kind of a. Uh, this is you know a mystical battle between the earth and the netherworld, and it's you know if you like that kind of thing, Constantine-ish, right? Yeah, a little bit like Constantine. And then the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my life: Assassination Classroom. This is Blu-ray DVD combo pack. Um, Assassination Classroom is Mars. This thing is totally from Mars. I don't understand this. I talked to Charles Solomon about this at one point. Last time I was on Film Week with Charles, who is, of course, our animation uh, go-to guy on Film Week and in in, uh, LAFCA. And Charles knows all this stuff. He's totally... I, I said, Charles, what is up with Assassination Classroom? He tried to explain it to me, and then he said, it's kind of insane, doesn't make any sense. He's not a fan. I don't really get it either, but it, it you know the idea is that you've got uh, it is literally an assassination classroom, but the whole thing is kind of sort of sometimes funny and it's a little sci-fi-ish and uh, it it's I, I don't I don't really get it anyway. Season two, uh, or, I'm sorry, season one part one came out some months ago. This is season one part two. And uh, I, you know, if you, if you, if anybody can explain this to me and exactly what the whole point of this is and uh, why the octopus, the teacher is an octopus, I would appreciate it. Um, but it, it just it feels like something they made up as they go along, like they were taking too many drugs. Uh, so God, <laughs> God, seriously, gods at digigods.com. Explain assassination classroom to me, please. I just want to know where this. I'm sure there's some school of anime that this makes sense in. So anyway. There is that. And um, let's see. I'll do just a couple more here before we round out on television. Uh, Naruto Shippuden from uh, Shonen Jump. This is, epi- this is DVD set 25. Just let people know that this is out there. This is original and uncut episodes 310 through 322. If you have kept with it that long, good for you. And then The World of Bleach. Uh, which is awesome. a lot of fun if you if you love you know the kind of fantasy samurai stuff that they do with the with the Bleach series. Uh, we've got a two pack of two movies here: uh, Bleach Fade to Black and uh, Bleach Hellverse, the movie. Um, so Fade to Black and Hellverse double feature, and then on Blu-ray uh, the, uh, the the set one of the series. Uh, with uh, episodes 1 through 27 first time ever on Blu-ray is Bleach first time ever set 1 so that also from uh, Funimation good good stuff Tim let's talk TV got some interesting stuff here actually um, I only watched a few uh, episodes of Rain during the first season um, uh, but I did find it an interesting sort of take on that history it's, it, it's all the stuff that has to do with Mary Queen of Scots uh, 
and, and uh, the Queen of England and, the, and, and, and King Francis and all the sort of political and court intrigue that was going on during that period of yeah. time. All played by actors who were much more attractive than these <laughs> actual people, by the way. Look these people up. They didn't look anything like this. <laughs> uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, their positions of state and power were kind of saying, this is the third season of Reign, uh, and uh, it, it starts to speak to some of the historical moments again when, in fact, Queen Elizabeth started plotting against uh, uh, you know, you know, Mary, right. Queen of Scots. It was the whole right. thing. These are things, events that actually happen mm -hmm. in history. This series takes lots of liberty with that, you know, besides people's looks. But nevertheless, it's sort of couched in that whole sort of context. Third season, uh, this uh, runs on the, on the CW. Uh, a Little House on the Prairie. This is a set of the, uh, I believe it was three, one hour, uh, three um, extended movies that oh, ended yeah. the series yeah. itself, right? Yeah. Little House on the Prairie, which, by the way, began in, believe it or not, 1974. Did it really? 1970. You're kidding. Four. That's when it began. Wow. Uh, which just kind of blows my, 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 my mind uh, a little bit. Yeah, I watched every single episode of Little House on the Prairie in yeah. real time. Wow. Over the course of all those years, a legacy movie collection tells the story of the thing that concludes uh, with uh, you know these heartwarming movies, all restored. Uh, includes uh, the movie specials and the behind-the-scenes specials that, that you know they had on television yeah. at the time that the movies appeared on TV. A look back at all of that uh, on uh, DVD and digital. There, correct? Yep. Uh, the Titanic, 1996, I believe was the year. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that there was a gigantic Titanic mir miniseries, yep. right? Yep. Uh, Peter Gallagher, Eva Marie Saint, Tim Curry, a whole yep. bunch of people. Now, the year that the movie came out is, I want to say... 97. 97, right? Mm -hmm. That movie wiped this television miniseries out of existence. Uh, once, this was a big event. This was like a yep. 13, 14, 15, yeah, 20 million deal. dollar movie. Yeah, it was a big deal. Um, uh, at the time, but it was on television. Uh, James Cameron, you know, d did his thing. CGI special yeah. effects. This couldn't begin to match what James Cameron did. Plus, James went for the love story. Yeah, went for the love story. This doesn't go for the love Most story. Most of the others didn't. That was uh, the one thing he did right. He understood that people yeah. don't really care about the boat sinking. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 I get, I'll give him credit for that. Not much else. <laughs> Wonder Years. Believe it or not, Wonder Years, 1988, mm. I believe, was the year that Wonder Years uh, started. This is season six of the Wonder Years. Again, watched every episode of the Wonder Years in real time uh, when it was on Fritz Savage and uh, Danica McKellar and all yeah. of the kids. This is season six. This is this is when the Wonder Years start to really get interesting <laughs> and started to. And started to really reflect, my, because the thing about the Wonder Years for me and you, Wade, is that we were these kids. Totally. So this, when, when this, this television program was going on, what we were doing is looking back at a historical representation of our lives from 15 or so years earlier. Uh, uh, set in the sort of mid, middle 70s and all, during that whole sort of period there. So this was the, was the period when the kids went to high school. They first went to high school yeah. uh, and had started going to separate classes and went always in class together and there were other boys and, and, and Winnie was, was interested in other boys and, and, and then I think Kevin was interested in other girls. This was that year. And again, I, got, I must say that this, The Wonder Years is just one of the television the series that I, that I just think really nailed it in, time, in terms of time and place, just the zeitgeist of the actual era that it represents. It's so good that when you watch the show, you feel like you're watching the show set in that era rather than a show that's actually being made yeah. 15, 20 years after the, after the era in which it is set. And then when we watch it now, yeah. 30 years on from that, even more, I have to remind myself to wait, no, <laughs> that wasn't... 1975, that's 1988. Oh and all, it's just a whole thing. It's very interesting. Uh, season 6, 22 episodes. That's another period when an episode, uh, when a season run of a, a yeah. show, yeah. 22 episodes. Now you can get a whole season run in six episodes. Uh, Crazy. Uh, for folks uh, who, do, who don't know, for elderly folks who were around, <laughs> I think we, we, uh, Milton Burl made a workout. <laughs> Unbelievable uh, uh, DVD uh, in his later years. Milton Burr's low impact, high comedy workout. This is just it was a straight to DVD kind of thing that Milton did, and he did it uh, 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 with comedy and humor. Uh, he, I think Milton died in about two thousand, two thousand one, two thousand two, or something like that. So plainly, uh, all of this goes back a while. Bonus materials: Milton Burr, 
Milton Barrel Show episodes on this workout DVD. So you can put this in, actually work out with Milton Burrell and a bunch of his elderly friends I while don't... Milton tells jokes. Uh... And then when you get bored with that, you can pop over to the special features and watch Frank Sinatra, Carol Channing, Ronald Reagan, and Zsa Zsa Gabor, among others, uh, in excerpts from the actual Milton Burrell television program. Yeah. Uh, the Catch. We got the uh, first complete season of The Catch. The Catch, one of the Shonda shows. Yep. And uh, I, I am, uh, I'm, I'm sort of elated at the career of Murray Enos because I, yeah. I, I know the family very, very well. I've been in Murray Enos's house, so I'm uh, the lead. The lead, yeah, who previously yeah. was on, uh, on the, the, the Killing. Yeah. Uh, that was her previous show, and she's wonderful on this. I mean, it's much lighter than uh, than Killing was. The killing was, and she's just great. Well, she's this, lives, this lives in this lives in in, in, in in the space that the Shonda shows yeah. take up, yeah. uh, which include, of course, uh, Scandal and and uh, How to Get Away with Murder and Grey's Anatomy yeah. and all of these sort of. It's sort of got it's got the Shonda Land and, and yeah. Matter. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, it, it's it's, it's uh, really really interesting stuff. Very playful. Very very light show. And then uh, uh, Wei Mei, uh, the Motown, twenty five year yesterday, uh, today, and forever. Kind of set. This is this is this is. We're going to revisit this for the Christmas show. I just want everybody to know this will be a gift guide inclusion. Absolutely. That that program um, and, and and folks may remember this specifically. Man, I can't I can't tell you what what an impact this show May sixteenth nineteen eighty three Motown uh, twenty five year um, uh, reunion anniversary. Yep. Uh, acts on stage that had not been together on stage for years. Two or, or, or two different sets of the Temptations. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it was like twenty Temptations on stage all at the same time, <laughs> singing the ones that weren't dead anyway at, at that particular period. And, and then, of course, that spectacular performance yeah. by the gloved one. Yeah, uh, he moonwalk and with that one glow. It was, it was, it was that, that was that was one of those legendary TV moments. A legendary it? TV a moment, legendary, legendary totally worthy moment. of this of this spectacular box set. It literally says it on the box, a soulful spectacular box set. I, I'm reading the words, and, 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 and man, you know, it was it was a big big deal in television history. This moment, I miss the the days when a legendary television musical performance means just being good, as opposed to. Oh my gosh! They took their clothes off and yeah. simulated sex and did all these other outrageous things. It's never about the music. Yeah, this is the last time somebody did it, and people said, "No, it was just amazing." Oh, actually, it was just amazing. You know, the last time it really was when, oh. when Whitney Houston sang the Star Spangled Banner. Yes, that's true. Whitney that Houston true. singing that Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, I think you know. Yeah, it was so so earnest and so powerful. I was going to say Prince's halftime show. Too. Oh, Prince's halftime show was fantastic yeah. too, actually. Yeah. But that, yeah. but the, so there you go. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so so there are Motown, twenty five year anniversary. Um, this is a big ass box. It's actually just kind of lovely in and of itself. You know, the setup of the box. Uh, that's big and full and full of all kinds of bonus material. And then the last one this week. Boy, this is the big mama. We're That's gonna, the big box, baby. We're going to revisit this for the uh, for the gift guide show too, because uh, I know Mark's going to want to weigh in on this uh, at some point. This is the the big the big one you've been waiting for. This is the Star Trek fifty year anniversary box set. This thing you're going to want to double dip on this if you already own the original series and all the movies. You're going to want to definitely get rid of them because this is it. This is phenomenal. Uh, this is the original series. This is the, uh, it, let's see, the original series, Star Trek The Motion Picture, both versions, Star Trek 3, 4, 5, 6, and the animated series, and it's amazing. It's got so much stuff, you just, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's hard to get through it all. So, uh, all of it in Blu-ray, and the animated series, of course, is the one that I love the most that uh, Mark is never going to let me for, live down. He will, he will never forgive me for that. But uh, this is absolutely terrific. This is, this is the ultimate Blu-ray collection of everything pertaining to the original series and the animated series and the movies and you know the whole Shatner, Nimoy era, the original cast. Mark that is, is not about that animated. You know what was great about that animated series? Yeah. They would go outside in space. You know, they would spacewalk yeah. and they just had that sort of force field yeah, thing yeah, around yeah. them. I've great. always thought that they should have used that in some of those later movies. That yeah. sort of notion yeah. of, of, of a little personal force field bubble 
Totally. And then they could just walk around. They never quite got there. Well, they, there are just heaps of extras here as well. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I, there's, you know, if you need me to recommend this, you, you, you're, you're not a fan. Yeah, so okay. uh, we will revisit this again, of course, uh, at holiday time. And uh, this is just one of those great things. Everybody was waiting for this. It's worth double dipping. If you already own all this stuff on Blu-ray, go and sell that stuff at the used DVD store and, and upgrade because it's absolutely worth it completely. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, Tim, thank you. Not yeah, sure. Not sure. Sure, not sure if uh, Mark's going to be up to it again next week. We're going to kind of play it week by week, see how long it takes for him to uh, get his strength back, get his voice back, and we'll see you guys again soon.